For those of you new to this topic, there were basically two types of Nazi camps. The extermination camp, for which the sole purpose was the mass killing of human beings. The German word for extermination camp is Vernichtungslager. The Konzentrationslager, or concentration camp, was also a place of horror. But while in hundreds of thousands of cases there was no real difference between the two types of camps, very generally speaking, there was a greater chance to survive in the camps designated KZ or KZ as the letters and acronym was pronounced in German. In the extermination camps, one's chance of survival were dramatically reduced. Though it is the most infamous camp, Auschwitz was actually three camps. Auschwitz I, Auschwitz II, Birkenau, and Auschwitz III, Monowitz. As you may know, Auschwitz is the German word for the town of Oswiecim in southwest Poland, where the camp was located. By the time Auschwitz II Birkenau was gassing its first victims in March 1942, the name Auschwitz already chilled the blood, at least for those in the know. By the time the name filtered down to the people on the lowest rung of the hierarchy of the Nazi state, the Jews and others who made up the Nazis' victims, rumors abounded about what really lay at Auschwitz. And make no mistake, by 1943, the knowledge of what Birkenau, whose name Place Among the Birches peacefully belies its function, was an open secret. SKPs and the Polish resistance disseminated the information, though most of the information went to governments and military men in the Allied countries. But, as one saw in the famous movie Schindler's List, the Jews, who made up 90% of the victims of the Holocaust, had heard rumors about what happened at Auschwitz, although they, like many Nazi victims, went into denial, for to believe the rumors was to lose all hope. However, Auschwitz I was the initial camp, and through the German forces, the Polish population nearby, the inmates, and the resistance inside and outside the camp, dark rumors of what went on in the camp made their way through much of Europe, beginning in late 1939 onward. It should be mentioned that Auschwitz I was deadly, to be sure, but it functioned as a prison camp, and many people were released after doing their time. These would consist mostly of petty criminals. A number of political prisoners were also released, having recanted their opposition to the Nazis and signing a paper in which they declared they would not speak of what they saw to anyone, on pain of death. For many of those released, the experience of Auschwitz was enough to guarantee their silence. They did not want to return. However, a number of those released either rejoined or joined the resistance, and through them, much of what you're about to learn reached the outside world. If you're interested in this tragic topic and want to learn about other unusual or dark moments in history, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. One of the guards at Auschwitz I was the man nicknamed the Tiger of Auschwitz for his viciousness, and who has the dubious distinction of having had a method of punishment and torture named after him. The Tiger of Auschwitz was Wilhelm Bulger, who had been a policeman in Stuttgart before the war and a member of a right-wing nationalist group before he joined the Nazi party in 1929. He was admitted into the ranks of the SS the following year. By the time he was stationed at Auschwitz in 1942, he had been indoctrinated for nearly 13 years with Nazi racist ideology and truly believed both that those opposing Nazi policy and those deemed by Hitler to be racially inferior were truly Untermensch, the Nazi term for subhuman. At Auschwitz I, Boga immediately recognized that the guards had almost complete latitude over the punishment of inmates. Though at Auschwitz I there were already a variety of ways to torment prisoners, Boga is the only one known to have had a method of cruelty named after him, called the Boga Swing. The Boga Swing was just one in a long line of torments for those imprisoned, and seemingly a means of amusement for some of the more sadistic guards like Boga. These included forcing half-starved, half-clothed men to do calisthenics in all weathers, either before or after a 12- or 14-hour workday. In many cases, those not doing the exercises properly were beaten and forced to start again. Those who did not get up were often beaten to death. 
Another form of torment came when the prisoner was put into an incredibly small concrete cell. Small enough so one's rump touched one wall and one's nose touched the other. There was no room to bend the knees, no place other than on oneself to pass waste, no water or food given, and no light. Prisoners were often left inside until they died. This was known as the standing cell. Many of those killed at Auschwitz I were killed on the spot. One cruel method of execution found guards like Boga ordering or encouraging the camp capos to place a crowbar over the upturned throat of a prostate inmate, then slowly apply pressure with both feet, crushing the victim's windpipe. More about the capos in a moment. The Boga swing was this. A three-foot iron bar was suspended horizontally from the ceiling, from chains. The prisoner, and this could be a man or woman, would be forced to strip, then bent over the iron bar, then their ankles and wrists would be shackled together. Then a guard would push the prisoner as if on some kind of sadistic playground swing. All the while, Boga would torment the victim by asking, then yelling, questions. Perhaps they had violated some rule were suspected of something, or perhaps had just been in the wrong time in the wrong place in the camp when Boga sought a victim. Each time the victim passed in front of them, another guard would strike the victim's buttocks or whatever part presented itself with a crowbar, propelling him for another swing. Most victims fainted, but Boga had them revived with ice water. This would go on most times until literally the victim's bones and fat turned to jelly, hanging in a bag of flesh of what once was a person. Most times, Boga and his assistant, if that wasn't a particularly cruel capo, would shower, dress into a new uniform, and go about their day, which could include a canteen that always had plentiful food, as opposed to those Germans at the front, a tavern where they could drink themselves into oblivion, or perhaps to an office to write a mundane report about the day's activities. And remember, the Nazis believed they were justified in their actions and recorded an unbelievable amount of information. Boga was arrested many years after the war and sentenced to life in prison for murder in 1965. He died in 1970, having not experienced anything like the torments of his victims. What was a capo? A capo, taken from the Italian for captain, was an inmate who was given special privileges for making sure the prisoners both stayed in line and did what they were told when they were told to do it. The capos at Auschwitz I were mostly German or Polish criminals and, by many accounts, essentially ran the place, at least on the level of the barracks and prisoner behavior. The capos at Auschwitz I in particular were deliberately chosen by the Germans for their crimes murderers, mob enforcers, violent rapists, etc. The lowest of the low. And all were encouraged to let out their aggressive tendencies on the inmates. The crowbar strangulation punishment described above was invented by a particularly sadistic capo. One of the main responsibilities of the capo was the maintenance of order during the Appel, or roll call. For the Germans, this was of prime importance, and the proper counting of the prisoners would tell them not only if there had been an escape, but also who had died and how many, in the case of the extermination camps, would be sent to the gas. The Appel was not just a count, but a way to review the health and strength of the prisoners. The roll call happened at least twice a day, in the morning at around 4 to 5 a.m., and in the evening when work was done and people were confined to barracks. Oftentimes, the Germans or capos miscounted, or they deliberately would take roll twice, for the inmates were hardly clothed, weak, and the roll call took place in all weather. The appel was hated by everyone, including the guards. In return for their violent punishment of the prisoners and their keeping order, which meant preventing any uprisings, no matter how small, a capo might receive extra food, alcohol, a room with a small number of other capos, or even a small room to himself. There were female capos assigned to the women's camp. Many of these women had been madams, 
running cheap and low-level houses of prostitution before being sent to Auschwitz. In other words, they had experience keeping women in line. In terms of sheer numbers of victims, Auschwitz II Birkenau was the deadliest of the Nazi death camps. An estimated 1.3 million people were killed there over the course of about three years. However, the camp near the small rail station of Treblinka, about 110 kilometers northeast of Warsaw, killed more people in a shorter time. An estimated 875,000 to 975,000, a little over a year. What's more, it is believed that only about 70 people who had been at Treblinka survived the war, whereas it's estimated about 12,000 people who had passed through Auschwitz at one point or another had survived. The guards at Treblinka consisted of a German corps of officers and NCOs, but there were a large number of Ukrainian auxiliaries that enforced rules at the camp and assisted in the extermination process. It should be said that, before the war, Soviet leader Yusuf Stalin's regime created a man-made famine in Ukraine and ruthlessly put down an independence movement in Western Ukraine right before the German invasion in June 1941. Many Ukrainians had had decent experiences with the Germans who occupied their land in World War I, and many expected the same. When the Nazis invaded, they set many Ukrainian nationalists free and allowed them to get their revenge on the Soviets, many of whom were Jewish, or at least believed to be. It must be said that, at the time, anti-Semitism was strong in most parts of Eastern Europe and Ukraine was no different. This does not in the least excuse the vile behavior of those Ukrainians that worked at Treblinka and elsewhere, but neither does it in any way associate today's Ukraine, which has a Jewish president, whose family survived the Holocaust, with Nazism. It should also be remembered the many, many more Ukrainians served with the Soviet army against the Nazis than collaborated with them. There were six extermination camps. Auschwitz-Birkenau, Shelminor, Majdanek, Sobibor, Belzec, and Treblinka. All were located in Poland. At Sabibor, Belzec, and Treblinka, fences covered with pine branches hid the main extermination areas, which, at all three camps, were gas chambers harnessing the exhaust from truck and or tank engines. Leading to the areas of the gas chambers was a sort of funnel through which victims were driven like cattle. This was known to the guards as der Schlauch, or the tube. In some cases, it was referred to as the Himmelfahrtsweg, or the way to heaven, a play on the German word for Jesus' ascension. One of the guards at Treblinka was Franz Suchamel, who evaded prosecution, but was later found in Germany, interviewed, and secretly filmed and taped by the Holocaust documentarian Claude Lanzmann for his epic film Shoah. Suchamel described the quiet, almost kind words of the German guards as victims were told to undress. This happened in the open air, men, women, and children together. They were told that they would be led to a shower and would be given clean clothing. Those who were slow in obeying were beaten. The Germans knew that once people were naked, they were more likely to comply. So, after they undressed, they were led into the large enclosed area which included the tube. Here, the Ukrainian auxiliaries, accompanied by Germans with guns and dogs, laid into them with wooden and rubber truncheons. Their Schlauch was set up exactly like a slaughterhouse for cattle. One of the phenomena of keeping prisoners in substandard conditions is that they become dirty and malnourished and consequently, their appearance comes to revolt the very people who caused it in the first place. Suhamel told about how women were kept back and men were pushed into the gas chambers first. This because men would more likely resist once they realized what was happening. The women would hear the engines turn on, the sounds of the men pounding at the door and screaming for about 15 to 30 minutes. This is when they realized what was happening to their husbands, fathers, etc. And while Suchamel and other guards watched, the women went into what the guards called the death fear and soiled themselves front and back. The stench and the sight often enraged the guards, who lit into the women once again. 
On the way to work, Suchamel and the other German guards would sing a song written by their commandant, Franz Stangl, who escaped to South America but was eventually brought to Germany in 1967. He died in 1971 while serving life in prison. He sang it for Claude Lanzmann. Here is the cheerful sounding song that German guards sang on their way to murdering perhaps 12,000 to 14,000 people a day. Looking squarely ahead, brave and joyous at the world, the squads marched to work. All that matters to us now is Treblinka. It is our destiny. That's why we've become one with Treblinka in no time at all. We know only the word of our commander. We know only obedience and duty. We want to serve, to go on serving, until a little luck ends it all. Hurrah! In Lanzmann's film, Suchamel says, We were laughing, but it's so sad. To which Lanzmann replies, No one is laughing, and encourages Suchamel to sing it again, loudly, which he does, ending with the words, Satisfied? That's unique. No Jew knows that today. If you learned something today and would like to learn more about the Holocaust, World War II and other topics, please subscribe to our channel now.